Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. S. J. Shankar, the Minister of External Affairs of India. Good afternoon, Dr. S. J. Shankar, Minister for External Affairs of India. Your Excellency, Dr. Shilpak Ambuli, High Commission of India to Singapore, Professor Tan Tai Yong, Chairman of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, Associate Professor Iqbal Singh Sevia, Director of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISAS, at the National University of Singapore, I warmly welcome you to today's ISAS Distinguished Lecture titled, Why Bharat Matters, by Dr. S. J. Shankar, the Minister of External Affairs of India. Before we start the proceedings, let me take a few moments to share a little more about our esteemed guest speaker. A diplomat turned politician, Dr. J. Shankar has earned the statue of the most eloquent and sharp defender of Indian Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi's foreign policy. The former foreign secretary is the first career diplomat in India to become the country's foreign minister. Handpicked by Prime Minister Modi, Dr. Jay Shankar has been the Minister of External Affairs since May 2019. As a diplomat, he has served as India's ambassador to the United States, China, Singapore, and Czech Republic in addition to the other diplomatic assignments in several other countries. And prior to entering politics, Dr. Jay Shankar served as the Global Corporate Affairs President at the Tata Sons Private Limited. Dr. Jay Shankar was honored with the prestigious Badmasri Award by the President of India in 2019. And he received his Master's in Political Science and an MPhil and PhD in International Relations from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed an honor for ISAS to have Minister S. J. Shankar to deliver today's ISAS Distinguished Lecture. Thank you, sir. And it's my pleasure now to invite ISAS Chairman, Professor Tan Taiyong, to deliver the welcome remarks. Professor Tan, please. Dr. S. Jai Shankar, Minister of External Affairs, India, ISIS Management Board members, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues. On behalf of ISIS, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, distinguished lecture entitled Why Bharat Matters. We are honoured to have Dr. Jai Shankar deliver this lecture. India's growth story has drawn global attention with a growth of 7.2% at a time when the global economic outlook seems rather grim. India has demonstrated impressive resilience, moving from the eighth to the fifth largest economy in the world over the past decade. On the strategic front, there appears to be a shift in India's relations with major powers, such as the US, China, and Europe. India has become a more active player in the Indo-Pacific region, engaging through many lateral groupings, such as the Quad and the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. At the bilateral level, India has moved to deepen its ties with key players to include comprehensive strategic partnerships. A number of other free trade uh, agreements have also either been concluded or are currently under negotiation. Apart from this, a recent agreement between ASEAN and India to deepen their existing comprehensive strategic partnership on key issues such as the blue economy, connectivity and food security shows the interest among the Southeast Asian countries, including Singapore, to work more closely with India. 
On the international stage, it's widely said that India is now becoming a voice for the global south. During its G20 presidency last year, India strongly pushed for a more sustainable and inclusive agenda, focusing on economic growth, financial stability, and development needs, issues that are of major concern to developing countries. The inclusion of the African Union as a full member of the G20, and separately the expansion of the BRICS, also bear testimony to India's commitment to bringing representatives of the Global South to the table. We also see that India is now emerging as a prominent voice for new age challenges such as climate change, technology advancement, and world health, among others. However, while India has made impressive economic and strategic progress, there are challenges that lie ahead. The intensification of great power rivalry has transformed the assessment of national security concerns for countries across the world. Global developments such as the growing contestation between China and the US, the ongoing war in Ukraine, and the, more recently the Israel-Hamas conflict have tested India's ability to tread the diplomatic tightrope. China's growing footprint in India's neighborhood also continues to remain a concern. Today, we live in a world where the after effects of the pandemic and the global supply chain fragmentation have seemingly accelerated deglobalization, protectionism, and a struggle for a balance of interests among big and small powers. It has also highlighted the need for economies to de-risk and diversify. In the days to come, India will have to carefully balance its interests and ties to ensure stability and peace while also maintaining its own economic growth momentum. This afternoon, we are pleased to have Dr. Jai Shankar deliver the ISAS Distinguished Lecture. I'm proud to share that ISAS has a deep affiliation with Dr. Jai Shankar. He was a distinguished visiting research fellow with us before becoming India's external affairs minister. He spent some time at the Institute writing his earlier book. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Dr. Jai Shankar for recently launching ISAS's latest book, India and the Future of G20 in Delhi. Today, we're delighted to host this distinguished lecture based on Dr. Jai Shankar's latest publication, Why Bharat Matters. Like all of you, I look forward to hearing his thoughts on India's progress and achievements and the challenges that lies ahead, especially given the complexities of a more fragmented world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tan. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor now to invite the Honorable Minister of External Affairs of India, Dr. S. J. Shankar, to deliver the ISAS Distinguished Lecture. <laughs> Professor Tanta Yonk. Professor Iqbal Singh Sevia, distinguished guests, dear friends. Uh, I think all of you know I mean it when I say I'm delighted to be back in Singapore. Uh, now, when I look at this extraordinary collection of old friends, which I see in the room, I think I should be writing books more often. Uh, but, uh, it is really, for me, a great pleasure uh, to come here and uh, talk about my, my second book, the one uh, which I released in January. And, uh, but, and you know, uh, Singapore for two reasons. One, uh, what uh, Ta Yong mentioned, that uh, I started the daunting task of writing books the first time uh, when I retired from the Foreign Service. Uh, and uh, I was with ISAS as a fellow. Uh, and, uh, you know, once you do something the first time and it doesn't go too badly, you're tempted to do it a second. Uh, but also because uh, I do think there are uh, very serious debates today uh, underway in the world. Uh, and I can't think of a better location, really, uh, to lay out some of the issues uh, uh, of that debate. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, today is really, in a way, walk you through the book, 
uh, perhaps uh, discuss uh, what my own thought processes were uh, in that uh, uh, exercise. Uh, and then uh, hopefully uh, say something sufficiently provocative for all of you to react. So first of all, why did I write that book? I wrote that book because I wanted to really, really drive home the message that foreign policy matters in a globalized world. Now, you would say it's very obvious. I mean, it's, it's not a difficult message to give in Singapore. But in many ways, Singapore is an exception because Singapore, uh, for its own uh, prosperity, for its own progress, for since its modern existence, has actually navigated uh, uh, through the currents of international politics uh, very, very adeptly, judging the, you know, the temperature, the direction of the wind, the currents. But it's not that obvious uh, when you come from a much larger, uh, more uh, continental uh, uh, society, uh, which by the nature of its own size and uh, history and geography uh, often tends to be uh, less sensitive uh, to uh, the shifts uh, in, in uh, what is happening in the world. Now, in my book, I actually uh, uh, have a, a chapter uh, which tries to explain to an average person not involved, not uh, in terms of uh, directly taking interest in day-to-day -day foreign policy, why foreign policy is important. And it's important because there are the pluses and minuses of the world. Uh, the opportunities of the world, the challenges of the world. And uh, particularly in the last five years, definitely in the last 10, I think we have each of us in our own lives uh, experienced this very graphically. The dominant collective experience, of course, for all of us uh, has been the COVID. And when one thinks about it, you know, my mind goes back uh, to uh, early January of 2020, when we first started reading uh, about the outbreak of COVID. And I don't think any of us could have imagined at that time, you know, what, you know, how all consuming it would be, how it would take over our lives, what we would each one, because I can't imagine there's actually anybody whose life was untouched by the COVID in some form. So, the, the very nature of such a pandemic. Now, it's, it's not that pandemics have not happened before. Something somewhat similar happened almost exactly a century ago, the Spanish flu. But the intensity of this one, the speed at which it spread, uh, the, the, uh, the manner in which it affected its uh, lives was something really very unprecedented. Now, what it also did was it demonstrated to all of us, how much things outside our national boundaries mattered. Because in different ways, uh, you know, we depended on supplies of various kinds uh, from the rest of the world. And when those supplies did not come, they had direct or indirect, uh, immediate or cascading impact uh, on our lives. Now, as I said, the world has the pluses and minuses. Uh, on the one hand, the, the globalization of the world was demonstrated by the nature and the manner in which the pandemic itself spread. So too was the fact that we were all so extraordinarily reliant uh, for our daily necessities on one part of the global geography. And when that came under stress or in disruption, we all experienced the consequences to different degrees of severity. But there were other uh, examples of the globalization and why foreign policy matters as well. And I share here an Indian perspective. I mean, we were very major producers of vaccines. Uh, and, you know, I, I first, as a minister, I was in a group of about five ministers whom the prime minister had tasked uh, to deal with the COVID. Uh, so one part of it was 
watching this pandemic come towards you, trying to prepare a country uh, for uh, in terms of public health capabilities and uh, other uh, other uh, responses which were required at that time. But once it and and then again, you know, trying to go out in the world, get the the masks and the PPEs and the ventilators, uh, all of which, you know, the prices were exorbitant uh, at that time. But once we started responding, other aspects of globalization were also visible. And that too told us why foreign policy mattered, uh, which was the producing vaccines itself. We were in a way at the end of a complex global supply chain. And every part of that chain, which was really spread across multiple countries, had to work if vaccines were to be delivered. And one of my most uh, memorable, I mean, I would say actually honestly stressful uh, uh, memories of that period were going uh, to the US uh, in, in uh, 2021 uh, with a binder this thick about all the orders that had been placed uh, across the world, but in one way or the other, which went through the US. And, you know, until those were cleared, really the global supply chain for vaccine production wouldn't work. And I mean, to, to this day, I mean, I, I remember with very uh, deep uh, appreciation, deep gratitude, uh, the fact that my counterpart, uh, uh, Tony Blinken actually intervened to override what was uh, at that time uh, uh, the decision uh, of the administration to invoke certain laws uh, which were a barrier for the supply chain to work. Now, we saw this go up and down. Uh, we had, when the Delta variant came, we had a huge oxygen problem. And we sourced oxygen from across the world. And many countries, including Singapore, went out of the way to find some way of shipping uh, oxygen across to India. Uh, similarly, when it came to vaccines uh, themselves, uh, there was an international initiative, but we also felt a lot of countries might take them too long uh, to uh, get their turn uh, on that. In many cases, we supplied through the initiative or directly, uh, and actually 99 countries of the world uh, in one way or the other got their vaccines from India. So I mentioned the COVID uh, because I, I will come back to that subject again because perhaps nothing more impactful has happened in the last few years that would remind us of what both the challenges, I would say sometimes the dangers, as well as the importance of cooperation in responding to it, that what is it we need to do uh, to deal with it. If I can give you a completely different example, I go to another factor which reminds us why foreign policy matters. And that is the impact today of conflict on our lives, on our daily lives. Now, there was a time when conflicts could happen. It could happen somewhere else and we are in a different part of the world and you know, its impact on us. Yes, we read about it in the newspaper, we saw it on the television and probably it stopped there. It may have had some consequences maybe on the markets. But if one looks today, uh, whether it is the conflict in Ukraine or what is today happening in the Red Sea, we are seeing actually uh, what is an actual or potential or an averted major disruption uh, of our daily routine and actually of our way of living. Uh, in our case, I mean, uh, as, as a major energy importer, uh, when the Ukraine conflict started, I would, we saw the price of energy, price of oil virtually double in that period. Even when it settled down finally, uh, it was about 50% higher than what it was before the conflict started. Now how, you know, considering today that uh, I represent a society where our per capita income is less than $3,000 per annum, for us to take a hit on energy prices with all its inflationary consequences would have been extremely hurtful. So here foreign policy serves as an example of where a certain judgment, a certain resolve is able to serve national interest 
is actually, in a way, it protected uh, the Indian consumer uh, from what would have been otherwise uh, a very uh, unnecessary uh, rise in uh, energy prices. Or let me shift to something much broader than uh, a particular conflict. Uh, if one looks today uh, at the nature of the workplace, that too has changed. Global the workplaces have got increasingly global, uh, and we have uh, today uh, the you know the the reality of vast number of people who temporarily, a little bit more uh, less so, uh, go out in search of their livelihood, and we realize that you know, very, very, it was brought home to us again when COVID happened. Because you had, you know, people working in the hotel industry, the airline industry, the cruise liner industry, the maritime shipping, uh, students whose dormitories were closing, tourists who were standard abroad, business people who went out, didn't have flights to come back. And in fact, when we launched uh, a mission to get back to people to India, uh, it was called One Day Bharat Mission. Uh, the first set of people who were, I would say, the immediately impacted people were as high as 7 million people. And bringing back 7 million people in a matter of a few months uh, was, in many ways, probably the largest evacuation that has ever happened uh, in history. And I mentioned that to you, not because of the magnitude of what we did, but as a reminder today, how much actually people are spread out across the world, and therefore, what are the responsibilities uh, of a government that uh, come with it, and why it is important for people to understand foreign policy, because as they go out in the world, they too have to do a risk assessment uh, about where they go, when they go, how they go, uh, and these two uh, are factors uh, today. So overall, in terms of foreign policy uh, in a globalized world, I would say that it is today uh, shaping the global landscape. Uh, actually getting it right is very much uh, today uh, uh, the flip side of national development and progress. That we can't say this is inside, that is outside. I only do this, what is inside my country. It's not my business to know what is happening outside. The two are today very, very closely intermeshed. In a way, they have always been. I mean, uh, at least uh, for many decades now, all countries, whether it is the quest for capital or for technology or for best practices, uh, or I would say even for economic market access or for connectivity, yes, we interact with the world. We make it very much part of our, uh, of our economic, even social thinking. But it, the process today has got so much more intense, so much more interpenetrative and so much more pervasive uh, that uh, the idea that we can divide the world inside, outside is something that we need to grow out of. So that, in many ways, was a central message of my book. Now, flowing from that, of course, is uh, that if the world is so important, it's, a, it's equally important to understand this world. And to understand this world, we have to grasp the five big phenomenon, phenomena of our times, uh, globalization, rebalancing, which is, uh, in a way, uh, I would say the, uh, the relative weight of countries, regions is shifting, changing. Multipolarity, where rebalancing reaches a point where actually today you have uh, countries or groups who have a certain uh, determining role or an influential role. The impact of technology, which is far deeper than it has ever been before. And of course, finally, the competitive nature of world politics, of international relations, which has always been there. But with these five factors in mind, I think today's world also has some very uh, distinguishing characteristics, characteristics of our era, you might say. And it is important to understand that if one has to navigate the world, if one has to assess what are the opportunities, if one, have to, one has to understand what are the risks. And I picked six or seven of them, which I believe are very critical for all of us. And 
I highlight them in a way as challenges, but every challenge then has a basis for countries working together as a possibility to cooperate. Now, the first characteristic I would say is actually the weaponization of almost everything. Today, whether it is trade, it's investment, it is tourism, it is currency, it is a digital transaction, it is a physical movement, there is nothing that cannot be and that has not been weaponized. So the idea that we do things for our prosperity and good, and that's where the buck stops, that idea too is behind us. Almost everything in some way or the other is an exposure of some kind, is a, could be in the wrong circumstances, a vulnerability of some kind. Uh, and therefore, it is important, uh, certainly for major economies to be more self-reliant, I'll come to that, and uh, for many others to actually effectively uh, and adequately hedge. So how do we deal with this world where any manner of of activity and transaction can be used uh, as a point of pressure. The second is that national boundaries matter less and less. National boundaries matter less and less, not in a formal sovereignty way, but in terms of the fact that very often influences uh, and uh, I would say agendas are able to penetrate that very, very effectively. So I have uh, tried to address that in a, in a uh, chapter which is called Reimagining Security. That today a person doesn't have to go to some bad place to get radicalized. Radicalization can come to a very nice home without anybody else, even in that same home, actually knowing what is happening. Or the fact that, you know, uh, information, I mean, this is an era of AI and of deep fakes. But it is also an era where, uh, you know, political correctness and global agendas uh, try to shape uh, what is happening in different societies, try to influence uh, on a mass basis uh, the choices of nations. And a lot of it comes from this interpenetration of technology. The third characteristic, of course, which has been building up over the last 25 years is that of over-concentration over-concentration of production, over-concentration of technologies. And it's a, it's a simple risk analysis. I mean, if, if in the world, you know, a very large uh, proportion is dependent on, on a single source, you don't, I mean, it doesn't have to be even international relations. None of us running an enterprise would ever take that risk. And yet we, as the world, have actually ended up there that we have ended up, and this was brought home, perhaps this was one of the strongest lessons of the COVID. That, you know, why was it that for something as basic as masks, as PPEs, as ventilators, none of which was rocket science, why was it that the rest of the world was struggling? Why was it that for very basic medicines, you know, the, the APIs, the, the uh, bulk drugs, uh, you know, we were worrying about disruption of one area? So how does one today deal with this challenge of over-concentration? Uh, I would say, because the tendency and, uh, you know, is to deal with it as a political choice. But this is actually an issue for the economic well-being of the world. That you are actually, uh, this, you're not de-risking a country. You're actually de-risking the global economy. Uh, so that to me would be the third characteristic. Now, these have two uh, consequences. One, when it comes to supply chains, where it is important to have more reliable, more resilient, more redundant supply chains. When it comes to digital, I think we have a challenge of a very different order, which is the whole sensitivity about data, about you know who collects the data, who processes the data, who, uh, who deploys the data, uh, who monetizes the data. So the, the whole issue of trust and transparency in the digital field and of resilience and reliability when it comes to supply chains. Now, 
all this, I mean, because uh, uh, this was in a way the invitation which Professor Tantayong gave me, which is what is the re-globalization that we are looking about? Re-globalization today is the challenge of a much broader production uh, of many more supply chains, of, of dealing with digital uh, challenges in a way in which we are comfortable uh, where, where trust and transparency is concerned. And what it has done uh, is that it has actually, uh, no, no, I'm good. Uh, what it has done is that it has actually uh, created today a push for strategic autonomy in different parts of the world. Now, in India, we used to speak about strategic autonomy in the 1990s, maybe the early 2000s. For us, in our lexicon at that time, this largely had to do with protecting our nuclear option. And to some extent, I would say people thought of it uh, in terms of getting into you know, alliance arrangements or coming under alliance pressures. Today, people think of strategic autonomy in a very different way. If we go to Europe today, there's a big push in Europe saying, you know, we have allowed too much of our manufacturing to go out. This is even sharper in the United States. In the Gulf, strategic autonomy means, do we have enough assured supply chains where food security is concerned? Because that was a very big worry uh, for the Gulf during the COVID. So across the world today, what our experiences of the last five years have done is they made us much more insecure much more conscious of our vulnerabilities, much more uh, concerned about how we could be securing ourselves in difficult situations. Uh, and different countries have moved about it in their particular way. Now, where India is concerned, you know, uh, many of these uh, anxieties and drivers were already there. Uh, we have, uh, therefore, uh, uh, a quest towards what we call Atmanirbhar Bharat, which is like a self-reliant India. Uh, but the idea really is that there should be much more which is made in India uh, and much more which in different areas, including you know, energy resources, natural resources, where you have assured access uh, to, to what are your uh, critical needs. Now, apart from all these characteristics, of course, there is one other characteristic, which is uh, the big power competition. I refer here specifically to US and China. Uh, and what, when I was writing my first book, uh, people still thought of this as something tactical. They associated it with a particular administration and a particular president in the United States. If we today move up four years, I think most people today would accept that this is increasingly structured, that this is something which is going to be multi-administration, that this is going to be hardwired into the policies of uh, certainly the two main countries concerned, but in different ways, it is something which all of us have to think about uh, in a much more permanent way. Now, having described the world, how does India cope with it? Through a variety of responses, and I've again, uh, in the book, try to, uh, as, as someone inside the room. And, and again, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, which is I wanted to share, uh, you know, to, to make people understand, okay, what has changed and why has it changed? And actually, it's the people inside the room who can give you the best answer. I mean, it may be subjective, but nevertheless, it is an informed answer, uh, which certainly should be available to the public. So how does India cope? Uh, one, of course, uh, by uh, having a foreign policy, which is multi-vector. Uh, that multi-vector means the ability to engage all the major players uh, in as uh, effective and uh, positive a manner as possible. Secondly, by uh, reimagining and reworking the immediate neighborhood, which is why we uh, have uh, pushed uh, this outlook of what we call neighborhood first. Neighborhood first meaning 
as the biggest country of the Indian subcontinent, deal with our neighbors in a more generous, in a more non-reciprocal way, uh, uh, thinking much more long-term, uh, insulating the relationship from the ups and downs of you know, the politics which in democratic societies will, will naturally uh, keep changing. Then to look beyond the immediate vicinity towards what I describe as the extended neighborhood. Extended neighborhood starting, of course, first of all with ASEAN, Southeast Asia, uh, then with the Gulf, the, uh, and southwards what we have a policy called Sagar, which means ocean, uh, towards the island states, and finally towards Central Asia. So, I mean, it looks conceptually very neat and clear, so you go in four directions. But if you look at the common, you know, what is common to the four policies, it is each of these regions actually has a historical uh, connect with India, uh, that there is dormant or less dormant history here waiting to be tapped as the economy becomes uh, bigger, uh, as other factors come into play. Each of these regions is very fertile ground for closer engagement. And uh, my, uh, my uh, assertion in the book is a big part of the transformation of Indian foreign policy, other than the multi-vector uh, uh, you know, uh, multi uh, direction, has been actually this very intensive cultivation of the immediate neighborhood and then the four uh, extended neighborhood uh, uh, movement. Now, having said that, there is also the world beyond. And for much of the world beyond, what is happening uh, in India, with India, is of immense interest. And that is where the Global South comes in. Because the Global South, in many ways, is a larger constituency, which is bound to us through historical experiences. They are all uh, post-colonial societies. But which also share a development situation, that what happens in India uh, in terms of income, in terms of the relevance of that particular uh, development is actually something that they appreciate. So if you were to look at, let us say, digital, you know, what, anything digital which happens uh, in, in India is immediately uh, translatable uh, to the rest of the global south in terms of, uh, you know, what uh, uh, they could do uh, of a similar nature. Uh, and the, the reason why I put it to you in this schema, of course, is that uh, uh, eventually uh, today and India, which is the fifth biggest economy in the world, which hopes to uh, become the third by overtaking Japan and Germany in the coming years, has to start preparing for a global footprint. Uh, and therefore, beyond the region, beyond the extended region, beyond even the solidarity of the global south, Today, we have to think from Pacific Islands to Latin America to the Caribbean and start making the moves because in, in, these are not developments which can happen at great speed. They, they will need to be seeded, they will need to be nurtured, they will need to be tended over a period of time. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the, I, I will mention, in a sense, the, uh, the thinking finally in my conclusion. And I have focused on two, three specific issues, you know, uh, our relationship with China, because I believe that will be very central uh, to our prospects, to their prospects, and to the world. Uh, I have spent some time explaining the Quad, because I've had the very unique privilege of being associated with every stage of the Quad, including the first time when it didn't work. Uh, so from the time it didn't work to the time it did, and then how it sort of went uh, up uh, in terms of stature and, and substance. Uh, and of course, uh, I particularly focused on a few key partners because I felt I had not give, done that, given them uh, their due uh, uh, in my earlier book, which was Russia, uh, which was France, uh, and the United Kingdom. And then I have tried to round it off with a linkage uh, of what is happening at home, because setting our house in order at home setting our house in economic order, setting our house in political order, is also essential uh, for the rise of a power. So let me conclude by uh, conveying to you, in a way, what does all this mean to you? 
which is, you know, the title of the book, Why Bharat Matters. Uh, and that's a sort of nice way of saying that will be more in your life uh, than before. Now, we were, why would we be more in your life? One, of course, uh, because frankly, we're going to be a much bigger economy. Uh, I think today the uh, improved ease of doing business, the ease of living, the infrastructure, Gati Shakti program, the digital advances we made. Uh, so uh, the, 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 you know, there's today a momentum in India, which has to be experienced to be believed. You know, often I'm asked to convey that sense of change in, in a shorthand. And the one, some of you may have heard me say this before, so uh, please forgive the repetition if you have, that today, this is a country which builds eight new airports a year, which builds one and a half new metros, one and a half new cities of metro every year, which builds 28 kilometers of highway every day, and which for the last 10 years has built two colleges a day. So I'm giving you these four <laughs> figures really to, to convey to you, you know, whether it is the soft side, it's the HR side, it's the physical side, uh, it is the, the traditional road movement. And, and I could give you other, other figures to kind of drive home that uh, message of change. Now, it's not just, you know, a growth number or the, uh, the uh, you know, the physical assets. If you actually look at India, it's, it's very interesting. Take four representative aspects of Indian society, okay? Politics, cricket, okay, not necessarily in that order, uh, uh, business, and bureaucracy. I think if any, each, any of you are familiar with any of the four, you would see today they have become far, far more representative than they were 20 or 30 years ago. That if you look at the origins of, you know, people in any of this, that you have in business companies which have literally come out of nowhere. And when you actually track them down, they are from a third level, fourth level town of India, and which would be in the top 10 in a particular field. If you look at, you know, most of my colleagues in parliament, you know, they are far more diverse. I mean, I've watched the parliament from gallery for 45 years. So they are, you know, in a way, it's very interesting. You can actually see over 75 years that democracy has struck very deep roots. It has transformed much more of the society than even the society consciously uh, uh, is aware. And the result today uh, is actually something very different. Now, and that difference shows up in many, many ways. I mean, uh, uh, if one visits, I, I visit a lot of educational institutions uh, in India. And I tell people, you know, I remember, maybe not when I was in college, but let's say a few years after that. I mean, typically you would draw, trot out somebody who's done well. You know, this is the gold medalist uh, of the cohort. Today, when you go to a lot of institutions, they tell you, please give us one hour our students want to do an exhibition and we want you to meet five people who actually hold patents uh, from our university. So it's, it's, you know, you can, this whole startup culture, the innovation, uh, uh, when you look even at who do young people admire today, the, the, the unicorns of India are for young people a very, very commonly recognizable name. And that's a very powerful change. Uh, which is uh, in the happening. Now, the country is changing, but naturally the impact of the country in the rest of the world will also uh, accordingly uh, shift. And you can see that. I mean, you can see that, uh, as I said, when it comes to a Quad or a, a the Middle East Corridor, IMEC that we have announced, or the I2U2 grouping that we have done, or the, I, the India Pacific Economic Forum. So uh, there's much more that India is getting into, that India is involved in, that India is trying to shape, lead, push in different ways. Interestingly, uh, at a time when uh, much of the world is actually withdrawing inwards, particularly big countries, India is actually also taking on more responsibilities. 
So if you look today as India as a first responder, uh, you know, an earthquake somewhere, um, a cyclone somewhere, a mudslide. I mean, we've actually, it, it's, it's very interesting. I was, I was for a particular report cataloging, you know, my own tenure as a minister and as foreign secretary. And almost every year we have done one major operation somewhere. An operation which is a, you know, where we have responded to what is a natural disaster or a man-made disaster uh, in some other part of the world. We have to the, uh, the economic side of it. Uh, and uh, I, again, uh, you know, uh, as a conscious of the fact that we missed the manufacturing bus in the previous decades today, I can say that, you know, there's a degree of purpose and seriousness and investment today in manufacturing that we have not seen for a long time. Uh, one part of it, of course, is symbolized by the what is called the PLI scheme, the Production Linked Incentive Scheme. Uh, and we've seen, you know, a very good global manufacturing response to that. But across the country today, uh, and, and clearly with better logistics uh, and better uh, talent, uh, you can actually see that the, uh, that the uh, manufacturing message uh, is being taken and and I would stress new manufacturing you know a very interesting example is semiconductors where we have just uh, uh, signed our first fab agreement uh, uh, we've I think had three ATMP agreements so far two of them already in the making we have started to get machinery for semiconductors today uh, to uh, start to be built in India and uh, 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 where the government is concerned, we have entered into uh, understanding with 104 universities of India, so that they train, they, uh, they, uh, you know, modernize or tweak their engineering courses in a way in which uh, the resources for the semiconductor uh, industry would uh, would uh, uh, start to flow. And we all know today that HR, the human resources, is something which is a very, very big constraint uh, on that industry. Right now, we are actually uh, looking at a plan which would uh, give us in the coming years at least 85,000 new people uh, in the uh, semiconductor zone, but it's something which we expect to see grow. So the point I wish to make is that this is very much uh, uh, today uh, a society which will matter more and more by its weight, by its influence, by its contribution, uh, by its responsibility uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, we've had uh, a solid decade to build a foundation. Uh, I think now we are looking at, uh, you know, a quarter of a century ahead that many of the goals and even that in, uh, you know, I'm sure those of you who are very familiar with India would agree, you know, uh, that it's not always been the case that India has set 25 year goals for itself. Uh, that is something uh, which is uh, happening. I mean, uh, the, there's a 2030 goal and there's a 2040 goal and there's a 2047 goal. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the reason, as I said at the end of it all, within my own country, I would like you know, people uh, to get uh, more invested in all these changes, uh, uh, preparing themselves for what is to come. And you know, uh, uh, to the extent this communication helps with the rest of the world, uh, I hope it also explains uh, you know, what is changing uh, as we speak. And I have, of course, uh, this honestly is much more for communication at home. I have used one of our epics as a, as a lens through which uh, I've tried to explain uh, many of these changes. And I must tell you, my reader feedback has been very positive there. A lot of people have got the point uh, very effectively. So these are some of the thoughts I, I I took the liberty of sharing with you. Once again, I thank you for your attention uh, and I'd be very, very happy to respond to any comments, suggestions, advice uh, uh, that you may have. Thank you, Minister Sir. May I now invite ISA's Director, Associate Professor Iqbal Singh Sevi on stage to chair the interactive session, please.
Thank you, Dr. Sylvia. Thank you, Dr. Jashankar, for that um, engaging and thought-provoking um, lecture. And I'm sure we have uh, a lot of questions in the audience, but um, as the moderator, I'm going to make use of my position. Just ask uh, one and a half questions. And I'll be very brief, and hopefully me being brief sets an example for, for the audience to be brief as well, because I know we're all here to listen to Dr. Jashankar rather than ourselves. Um, with all due respect. Um, the, and I, I just like to um, draw you a little more on the, the entire context in which this book is, is framed. The book is responding to um, broader geoeconomic and geopolitical shift or shifts in the geopolitical and geoeconomic scenarios and the deep transformations that, that, are, that are going on and the questions that have been raised. And two aspects to this are one, the crisis of multilateralism that's, uh, that everybody is talking about and is concerned by. And the other is the redistribution of power in the global order. Um, and I'll just like to um, hear your thoughts on what needs to be done in the multilateral space to reform multilateralism, to save multilateralism, and the role India is poised to play in this. And secondly, the, um, the role that India is poised to play in the multilateral, uh, multipolar world that, um, that, is being, that is, we are advancing towards. So your thoughts, please. You know, uh, I spoke about, uh, in a way, globalization, rebalancing, multipolarity. And uh, the thrust of what I was saying was that uh, the world is profoundly different uh, from what it was eight years ago. And uh, uh, perhaps the most obvious difference is the number of countries in the world. I mean, they have quadrupled uh, in terms of independent countries, sovereign states have quadrupled in this period. So a big challenge for all of us is really how does the world uh, structures uh, reflect the world reality. Now, this happening on a world scale, it happens in different countries in terms of the politics and uh, you know, social changes as well. Uh, and we are struggling. We are struggling because uh, there is uh, enormous pressure to change. There is uh, very determined resistance to change. And so we've been having these uh, uh, sort of Groundhog Day-like debates, which are circular, where every year you start at the same point and you end up at the same point and you do it as a ritual. Uh, so uh, we are now trying to break out of it I think there's been some uh, improvement in the way in which actually the UN, there's, there's something called the intergovernmental negotiations on this. Uh, so people, you know, now uh, they are actually discussing what are the possible models which could be acceptable. There will be debate and discussion, but the longer we put it off, the reality is different countries will go and find their own solutions and do their own things. Uh, so. Uh, you will have more of these minilateral, plurilateral, uh, you know, call it what you will, uh, like-minded uh, groups uh, in different areas. Uh, so uh, what that would lead to is a kind of a fracturing uh, of, of the system, a very uneven performance. There'll be areas where a lot of people pay attention. There'll be areas where, frankly, nobody would care. Uh, and uh, it'll be a much messier world. Your second question, the redistribution of power. It, that, you know, that's happening. It's happening in very, very interesting ways. I mean, it's happening, uh, even, even the G7 to the G20 was one, one example of it. Uh, the fact that you have a group like Quad uh, is another example of it, that uh, uh, the logic of something like Quad is that you have four countries who are, uh, in different parts of the Indo-Pacific, but who have a common, who have a convergence, who have a common interest uh, uh, in, in uh, various aspects of the Indo-Pacific. Or the other example I gave to the West, which is the idea that a few countries get together and say, okay, let's uh, make this big push to build a new connectivity corridor uh, through the Middle East. So 
uh, and and you know that's one we in fact have something similar uh, or not similar is not the right word but something uh, in parallel going on uh, with what is called the international north south transport corridor which predates the middle east corridor uh, so uh, it's going to be a very uh, i would say uh, uh, a very indisciplined uh, uh, you know uh, uh, episodic unpredictable transition that we are going to see the transition is not going to be smooth uh, because the pressure for change and the opposition to change is are, are already colliding uh, and uh, uh, you know it will also be visible in more and more global solutions uh, sorry regional solutions that the era where uh, one country the us in this case could be expected to invest in solving many of the world's problems i think we have to today uh, be realistic about expectations of the united states there are many things the united states is not going to do and and if somebody else doesn't do it it just means it doesn't get done the floor is open now for questions we have uh, i see hands going up uh, and could uh, could i invite um, the four hands that have gone up there are four mics, so if you could make your way to the mic, and then I'll take questions as I see you standing at the mic. Um, yeah. And um, again, please do keep your question short. So yes, please. Go ahead. And could you please uh, briefly introduce yourself before you ask your question? Uh, good okay. Afternoon, good afternoon, sir. I'm a 20-year-old undergraduate here at the National University of Singapore. Uh, I was fortunate to get a full scholarship from the government of Singapore. So my question to you is, uh, generally as students, you're very optimistic about the India story, not just here, but even in the West. Uh, but uh, until we graduate or until we are here, uh, we as international students and strategic partners like Singapore, how do we contribute to India's objectives in a way that benefits not just India, but in this case, Singapore as well? So. Thank you, uh, Iqbal. Uh, this is Ravi Valur, Straits Times. Yeah. Oh. Dr. Jashankar, you know, in your preface to the book, you have this line saying that uh, when you met uh, Prime Minister Modi for the first time, then Chief Minister, you say that it was apparent to me even then that he envisaged developments in both India and China in terms of civilizational resurgence. Now, last week, uh, I watched you talking to Zaka Jacob, and uh, you sounded decidedly downbeat on the civilizational relationship. You know, the, you, uh, particularly, uh, you picked up the phrase Chindia. Now, there have been recent reports of India moving a whole division from the Pakistan border to the central sector, to the middle sector. Uh, now, normally one would have thought that the most problematic sectors were the uh, Arunachal one and the, uh, on the Ladakh on the, on the west. But it's particularly worrying when uh, one hears of uh, a division strength being moved to the middle sector. So is that relationship uh, going nowhere? Uh, where do you see it? We'll take one more question. Good afternoon. I'm Preeti Davra. I work in the president's office uh, at Nanyang Technological University. Last year, we had done the Singapore-India hackathon in IIT Gandhinagar at the request of Prime Minister Modi. And it was a transformative experience for so many of the Singapore students and startups who participated and traveled to India. Uh, could you explain to us, in, in, you know, why does it matter for Singapore, ASEAN, and other extended neighborhood countries to engage on technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship with India. What are you unleashing over there that is now suddenly put this India on a momentous scale to tap into that potential that India always had? My name is Bharat Manloy. Uh, I have two questions which are not so profound, so they're very straightforward. The first is being the external affairs minister of India, but more personally, what do you think is a possible roadmap 
for improving relations with two of our neighbors, Pakistan and China. And you don't have to be politically correct, I presume here. <laughs> Number two is I'm a OCI. I would like to know, do I get to see a dual citizenship in India at some point? Thank you. So we'll, we'll take this um, question. Yeah, we'll take may, this. Could you just, uh, may I ask? If you don't mind, let me let me reply to these questions. Then then I'll come back for a second round. Uh, so uh, let me uh, start with the young gentleman. You know uh, the uh, in a way uh, your question and Preeti's question are kind of linked. Uh, now you know what is it you can contribute? Look. Uh, I mean, first of all, you know, when you come out as an international student studying out here, uh, that itself is something of considerable value you are doing because you are becoming a, a kind of a bridge, someone who's lived here who can explain things back there, someone come from there who can ex explain things here. But what we are today seeing uh, among young people in, in uh, different uh, domains, uh, is an enormous enthusiasm uh, today to find their own solutions, to experiment. Uh, and and it's, it's really, you know, uh, uh, something which is so striking uh, that, uh, you know, as I, uh, I was giving you the example that if you go to a college today, they say, okay, a person has a patent. I went uh, some months ago, uh, this was after our lunar, uh, the Chandrayaan landing, okay? Uh, I went to uh, this uh, institute in Tiruvannandapura uh, where uh, they actually uh, educate people in space uh, technology. And I found, you know, students there who are still doing their degrees, who had in some form actually contributed something by the way of a technology or a uh, invention or a contraption which had been used by some mission some. Uh, and when I looked at the kind of facilities today that they have, the, uh, the manner in which they are putting it to use, uh, I mean, I spoke, you know, of this effort which we are going to start on, of which started already in a way on the semiconductor field. I mean, it isn't just that we are asking 104 universities saying, please change your curriculum. We are actually giving them today access to equipment and to, uh, you know, uh, technologies which will uh, give them a hands-on sense today about what is happening. So, uh, Preeti, the answer why, you know, for example, are hackathons uh, important? One, we ourselves have found so many solutions to day, you know, day-to-day -day issues or long tending uh, practices. And each of these, in a way, you know, is like, a, like an education. Uh, you know, one of the nice things of being a, a minister uh, is you sit in on gatherings and groupings where people are discussing something other than your own direct business. So you are actually learning many more things which you would not if you are looking at it in a much more uh, departmental way. So when today I hear about say how do we train drone operators for use of nano fertilizers. Uh, now you look at the, the levels of uh, change here that we are we are uh, talking about. So a lot of what you see today, you know, in fintech, for example, a lot of this coming out of very young people. So the idea is this old mindset that there are certain subjects, the government will be a big employer. If it is not the government, it will be a big company. We want people actually to be much more self-employed, much more uh, the startup culture employ other people of, you know, their uh, peer group. So you are actually trying to change the entrepreneurial technology culture uh, of the entire country. And that is why these, these are both, you know, uh, valuable experiences, but the messaging from that uh, as an inspiration for everybody else is very, very powerful. Uh, on uh, Ravi's uh, set of questions, okay because uh, the, the civilizational, the downbeat, the chindia, uh, the 10,000, the alleged 10,000 troops for the 
supposed middle sector. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, there are times when we have better things to do than to deny uh, uh, what uh, people might float. Uh, so, uh, no, here's a point. Look, why I uh, referred to it in my book was, I, I mean, just some of you may have read the book, some of you may have not. So very quickly as a recap, I write there that I first met Prime Minister Modi when I was ambassador in China. And I've described that very briefly. Now, uh, the, the fact is that uh, he, and today I think the country, sees the rise of India uh, in civilizational terms. Now we recognize today that that is also the case with the rise of China. So the challenge for me is uh, how do we find the a sustainable equilibrium today between uh, the uh, two rising powers who also happen to be neighbors and who have a history and a population which sets them apart from the rest of the world. And who have also capabilities, uh, which uh, with the passage of time could also set them apart from the rest of the world. So this is a very, very uh, complex uh, challenge. Now the starting point for this obviously would be uh, if uh, you know uh, we are trying to do something difficult, at least the parts that were worked out, keep them going, you know, keep it steady, build on it. So it came as a great surprise to us. Uh, when the Chinese in 2020 uh, chose to do something on the border which was uh, completely violative of uh, agreements we had reached. So instead of actually solidifying the foundation for an equilibrium, they went and disturbed the foundation. So the, uh, the big issue for us today, you know, from time to time, uh, we hear this that uh, we, you know, the boundary solution can take its time. We don't argue with that. It could. It's a very complex issue. We're not talking of the solving the boundary dispute. We are talking about maintaining peace and tranquility on the border. And we had. I mean, from 1975 till 2020, nobody got killed on that border. So for 45 years, it worked. We have to ask ourselves today, why is it not working now? And uh, until we have that stabilization of the border, uh, to me, it is illogical to expect that the equilibrium building, the relationship building, doing more things would move forward. Because it will naturally engender enormous distrust uh, if you, know, you didn't keep your part of the bargain, particularly if there's already prior history of this, of this continuing. So that's really the, the issue. It's, it's, you know, uh, here, I, I think it's important really not to lose the woods for the trees. I mean, there might be a report here or not, which may be true or not. Uh, it is, I mean, I think no sensible government confirms troop movements, least of all to someone from a foreign newspaper. Uh, but uh, but that, that said, uh, the, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are today trying, we are today trying to uh, uh, find a way out. And, and it's not easy. I mean, uh, I have myself invested, uh, you know, a great deal of effort with my counterpart uh, and at the uh, military commander's level, at the diplomatic level, uh, we've had uh, 20 plus rounds of talks. In a way that answers the next question, what is your policy towards uh, Pakistan and China? The China part I have answered. Uh, the Pakistan part, uh, look, every country wants a stable neighborhood. It's, it's logical, you know. If you, if you are a person living on a street, you want good neighbors. If nothing else, you want at least a quiet neighborhood. Uh, now, we have been, uh, what shall I say, unfortunate or ill-starred or... Uh, 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 so, to be blessed with the one that we have to our best. Now, here's a very, you know, basic problem. How do you deal with a neighbor who does not hide the fact that they use terrorism as an instrument of statecraft? Now, it's not a one-off happening. 
I mean, different countries at different points of time have experienced this. But a very sustained, almost an industry level, you know, assembly line of people whose job it is to do bad things at night. Uh, to, to produce this with the intent of pressurizing your neighbor becomes a real challenge. So what we have come to conclude is that we have to find a way of addressing it, that dodging the problem gets us nowhere. It only invites more trouble. So I don't have a quick instantaneous fix. But what I can tell you is that India will not skirt this problem anymore. We are not going to say, well, that happened and, you know, let's, let's continue our dialogue because that's very important. I think if we have a problem, we must be honest enough to face up to that problem, however difficult it is. If you have to have those discussions, we should. And if it is, uh, you know, hard to find a solution, we must work through uh, to the way. We should not give the other country a free pass saying there's nothing they can do about it or it's a very hard problem or there's so much else at stake that let us overlook it. In India, the mood is not to overlook terrorism. You know, I would say if you look in, in, in a way of what are the changes in India which have happened in the last decade plus, the, the uh, a great deal of public anger about a lack of response to a terrorism threat has been one factor uh, about the perceptions uh, in politics. Uh, so it is, it is a, a tough one. But it is something on which we will stay the course. Oh, dual citizen, sorry, dual citizenship. You know, on dual citizenship, uh, honest answer, we have, you know, at the moment, uh, this, this was, uh, the OCI was something which uh, was uh, decided upon, I think, uh, during Atalji's time. Uh, so it's about 20 years uh, old. Uh, We've had, you know, people give us ideas and so on, but I'm not aware of any, uh, you know, any specific discussion uh, saying, okay, beyond that, what do we do? I mean, I think people are still mulling it over and talking it over. I mean, that's, that's the state of play. Uh, we'll go for another round of questions. There was a gentleman who was standing uh, up earlier. So we'll start with him and then we'll go to you and then. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, my name is Manu. So, um, I, I'm a Singaporean editor of, uh, and writer. Um, two questions for you. Uh, you know, one, one is actually, you touched on that, uh, the China-India relationship. Um, there's a lot of water under the bridge. My, my question is, uh, do you think uh, Singapore being uh, close friends with uh, both China long-term relationship and India as well, and our population has also got majority Chinese with a good Indian minority, I mean, can, can Singapore play a role, you think, in sort of a, a gradual uh, you know, uh, improvement of relations between India and China, better understanding, so on? Uh, that, that's one. Uh, my second question is, um, again, India's uh, deep uh, relationship with Russia, uh, previously Soviet Union, now Russia. And however, I think that, uh, you know, I see India also getting closer to the US, in some ways, I mean, in the news uh, yesterday, just was about, uh, for example, the PRC claiming almost a whole state of India, Arunachal, and the U.S. stood up to say they recognize the border between India and uh, China on that front. Um, in, India is like, a, and you touched on all the startups and the unicorns in India. I think India is a young America in terms of your politics, in terms of your DNA. Uh, it's like America was 50 years, maybe 100 years ago, where they were starting to invent a lot of new things and pushing forward. So, uh, to, yeah, on that point, do you see India uh, in, a, in a mega trend moving closer to the US? Or will it stay, or will there be some kind of balance? Thank you. Well, just go to the gentleman over there at the back. So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Jayashankar. My name is Karthik Kadampuli. Uh, I've been a tech entrepreneur for about 20 years based out of India with global operations and currently based out of uh, Bangalore running a virtual accelerator. Now through all of this, um, what we had uh, seen, uh, not just in the last couple of decades, but for centuries, the Indian image externally is defined by the narrative that comes from outside and we are subject to that. It's heartening to see that, it's, it's very pleasant to see that there is a big change 
uh, India is not docile anymore. The messaging is a little assertive. But then the bombardment of narratives are so intense that you know, it's very difficult to find what is right, what is wrong from an external point of view. Internally, it's different. When we travel in India, it's different. My wife, Archana, and I, we travel a lot outside. The question thereby is, what's the plan? What's the strategy that Indian government has to kill this narrative and state what India is and is doing? Thank you. Good to hear Hi, Dr. Jashankar. I'm Anushri, a 21-year-old undergraduate student in Nanyang Technological <coughs> University. So I'm going to try to phrase this as well as I can. And so we're youngsters who have access to various kinds of media that at a pace and intensity that is unimaginable and often leads to, I mean, similar to the previous question, but leads to misinformed and uh, not so factually grounded opinions. So how do we as young Indians educate ourselves and encourage our peers to objectively see a changing India at a domestic and global level outside of the political and ideological divides? Yeah. yeah. We'll take one more question from the gentleman. Yes. Dr. Jaishankar, uh, my name is Kasi. Uh, a little away from uh, India, but uh, I wanted to check uh, uh, as a diplomat, more than even an external affairs minister, what is your reading of the situation in Israel uh, and the Palestine situation? And because India is friendly on both sides with the Arabs and the Israelis. Since how does India or you visualize the situation uh, gradually in the next couple of years or what is the solution in the long term? Uh, okay, uh, can we stop that? Then we can. Uh, well, you know, the first question, uh, yeah, well, um, I've heard many people use many terms for India, but the first time I've heard India is described as a young America. Uh, and I, I honestly, I, I honestly don't know what to make of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, can Singapore play a role on India, China, you know, in in interna you know, in world politics, sometimes you have countries who have helped carry messages. So, uh, if two countries are not dealing with each other, uh, to deal through a third country, we don't have any of those problems with China. You know, I I am in touch with my counterpart. Uh, you know, um, our. Uh, uh, um, um, we, you know, the embassies work in both countries, uh, diplomacy works, the military commanders deal with each other. And, and the issue is, is not uh, uh, really about, uh, uh, you know, miscommunication. I mean, uh, I, I assure you, you know, their English is wonderful and, I, <laughs> and, and our Chinese is even better. If any of you, uh, if, if any, any, any of you doubt me, uh, if any of you doubt me, please try your luck with the High Commissioner. Uh, so, so look, the, the issue today, the issue for us today is not of communication, uh, you know, uh, misunderstanding. It is really today of uh, uh, decisions and choices and policies which countries have made. And if somewhere uh, there is a situ the resulting situation is one uh, which is uh, uh, which has become a big problem. Then I think it behoves both of them to sit down and and uh, sort it out. So for us, you know, we're, we're not asking for the moon. I mean, what we are saying is, listen, we have agreements. We had an agreement of 93, 96, 2005, 2011, 2012. We have these written agreements. Both of us signed up to it. It's been working all the way till 2020. So why don't we sit down and sort it out and you know, uh, figure out uh, how, how we continue that uh, peace and tranquility which we maintain for so long. Uh, on Russia, US, you see these are, you know, when I said multi-vector policy, uh, today this is uh, uh, something which every, certainly every significant country is going to face, which is, if you have conflicting interests, if you have different partners, if you are, uh, if you are uh, uh, vested in relationships which are 
often uh, appear to be at cross purposes with each other. How do you actually reconcile this? Uh, and uh, the answer is clearly to find ways by which each one of them is dealt with on a non-exclusive basis. In fact, when I come to Israel-Palestine, I will take that same logic uh, into that. So uh, it will be for us, you know, how do we today deal with a, a good relations with Russia, good relations with Europe, or good relations with US, good relations with uh, uh, some other country? I mean, this, this is a way uh, which, you know, uh, today's diplomacy uh, is is uh, going to uh, require require us to do. Some of us will do it a little bit more successfully, some of us less so. Countries which have strong alliance cultures don't have that dilemma because they've already, in a sense, made their choice. You know, they've signed up to a larger group think uh, on a particular issue. Countries which are not part of an alliance will have to think this through for themselves. And India is clearly uh, uh, in that uh, category. Uh, the other two questions are somewhat similar, which is, you know, uh, there is an external narrative, you're bombarded with it. Uh, you know, uh, the, the other question was, how do we educate people to think objectively about India? So here's my uh, point. And, and I've actually, again, uh, written about it in the book itself. This is not an accident. You know, if people are saying, unflattering things. Uh, it could be due to ignorance, but it could equally be due to an intent or an agenda or a competition or some game plan. And uh, when we speak today about how the world is changing, you know, what happened first? What happened was as countries became free in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and you immediately saw the newly independent countries, many of them, not all of them, uh, become a much better production, economic production centers. Uh, ASEAN itself is a very good example. And therefore, b increasingly significant consumption centers. So over a period of time, you actually had uh, economic rebalancing. So when we speak about the tiger economies, for example, this is part of the economic rebalancing which happened once many more countries were allowed to make their own choices. Now, at some stage, the economic uh, rebalancing built up to a level where these countries said, but we also have political views. You know, we want a say in how big decisions are taken. And we saw that during the global financial crisis, that the G7 was not able to handle the global financial crisis all by itself. And so we actually ended up with a G20. And if you see in the uh, 15 years that have passed, 16 years that have passed, the G20 has actually sig continuously expanded its agenda. That uh, what it began doing and what it does today is, is far more. Now we come to the next stage. And the next stage is actually a cultural rebalancing, which is what is right, what is wrong, you know, uh, uh, how, you know, what is a value, what, uh, who gets to pass judgment on whom. These are all going to be contested. And in many ways here, the, the dominant force has been the West. Uh, and the West has maintained uh, that uh, ability to actually uh, become, you know, it's, it's a kind of both a player and an umpire uh, at the same time. Uh, and mostly they win as a result. Uh, so, so what happens today is people have to contest that. You know, others have to come on the field and say, no, I don't accept that judgment. And when you start diverging, and, and by the way, this is an industry in itself, you know, how to make rankings, how to give reports, uh, you know, how, how to use media. I mean, if you look at how the Western media actually shapes the reputation of countries, the perception of countries, it's a very powerful tool uh, that they have. So answer is in each one of these uh, to, uh, to uh, push back, to put alternatives, uh, to, to find different ways of, of placing that narrative. Uh, and now there are, fortunately, technology offers more solutions. So if somebody controls many of the newspapers, you have a social media option. Uh, or you know, in, if somebody is making a ranking, it's possible others will now start making their own ranking. 
so these will be actually uh, the coming, uh, I would say, features uh, of the pushback or of the uh, cultural side of the rebalancing, the narrative side of the rebalancing, uh, which I can uh, see happening. Finally, on the Israel, uh, uh, you know, our position here, because that's in a way an answer. We are very, very clear that what happened on October 7th was terrorist. Okay. There is, cannot be any defense of it. There cannot be any caveats to it. Uh, I think we need to be, we need to call that out, which we did uh, very unambiguously. Now, in terms of how the Israelis are responding, we've also taken the view that in any response, you know, the uh, care has to be taken about civilian casualties. International humanitarian law uh, needs to be uh, observed. And we are at a situation today where clearly uh, the need is to find a way of uh, delivering humanitarian aid uh, to a civilian population on a sustainable basis. But beyond that, uh, I think uh, uh, there is a larger, a longer term issue really, uh, which is some of these may answers for this problem, but what do you do on a more permanent basis? And we are very clear that we have to find a two-state solution. Uh, and it's not something, you know, we don't say different things in Israel and different things in Palestine. When I spoke about managing relationships, we, we, we have no hesitation in saying that publicly. So we deal with the Palestinians. We've actually stepped up our assistance in the last many years to Palestine. Uh, we do projects uh, with the Palestinian Authority. So there is that, there is this. We have to find a way in which the two uh, can be reconciled. We understand it is not very easy. Right now, there are very serious efforts underway, uh, you know, some of which I cannot speak about uh, publicly. Uh, and we are very, very supportive uh, of, a, of the efforts of a few countries who are working right now uh, to find a way out uh, of the present uh, situation. As the moderator, I have the very unpopular job of warning everybody that we have to wrap up very soon. So I can take two more questions, but if you restrict yourself to 20 minutes, 20 seconds, then we could get a response. Sorry, not 20 minutes. That's for later. Um, okay. but could I invite you to? Hi, Doctor. This is Charmaine from CNBC. Um, how do you see India-China relations evolving after the Arunachal Pradesh broad border dispute, especially since India has received support from the US? And what could be the economic implications given China's positive balance of payments with India? Thank you. And uh, the last question, please. Yes. Uh, my question is, what's your take on the brain drain issue with the increasing number of talented individuals like students and businessmen leaving India? How can we encourage them to stay? This is a scandal. Can I have a roti kapra type question, if you don't mind? Roti Kapra type of question, the film or the no, issue? So basically, I think there are lots of, lots of profound questions okay. here. So yeah, uh, so sorry. 10 seconds, please. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Jashankar. My name is Shubha. Um, so I'm a permanent resident here, and I think I see a lot of my friends are, you know, kind of getting the citizenship, and it's, it's great because they want the rate passport, because it gives a lot of access. You know, that's the, that's the logic which has been put forward. So I say it is Roti Kapra because, you know, I, I, I don't like to do that, but I just want to wonder, like, why is, why is India so slow in terms of getting the passport much more, much more acceptable uh, in that sense? And the other one is that a few years back, we, we banned a lot of the, uh, you know, the apps, the Chinese apps in India. That's what have we achieved through that? That's your roti kapra or theirs? <laughs> no, no. So <laughs> That's a good one, but I, I just want to know what we achieved through that, uh, that process here. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, thank you. On, on Arunachal, you know, uh, this is not a new, new issue. Uh, I mean, China has uh, laid claim, it has expanded its claim. Uh, the claims were ludicrous to begin with, they remain ludicrous today. Uh, and uh, Arunachal is part of India because it is part of India, not because some other country says it is part of India. So, so I think we've been very clear, very uh, uh, consistent, uh, on this, and I think you know that is something which uh, uh, will uh, be part uh, of the uh, you know the boundary uh, discussions which are uh, taking place. Uh, 
on the brain drain uh, issue, look, uh, I actually today I'm seeing something very different, uh, which is a great interest in what are called mobility agreements. Uh, and uh, uh, mobility agreements, uh, and, and it's very interesting when I look at the countries who are pushing it today, many of them are historically very conservative about immigration. But technology today is creating demands, uh, uh, you know, uneven demand supply uh, situations in different parts of the world. So I, uh, I think the idea that, as I say, drawing a line, this is inside and that is outside and people go outside, we lose something. I think we need to, to get over it because uh, if one looks at it objectively, uh, there are roughly 30, 3 million, 33, 34 million Indians and people of Indian origin living abroad. Okay. If I, if you had to ask me, uh, net net, are there a, are there a plus or a minus that they're abroad? I would say they contribute enormously and very differently. You know, uh, they contribute financially. They contribute in terms of ideas, in terms of being a bill. Many many of our key relationships have changed uh, because actually. Indians have built relationships abroad. I mean, if I look at Singapore, if I look at the United States, I look at the UK, I don't think our relationship uh, would be the same if you, if you minimize the diaspora factor. So I, I would urge you to look at it in a much more, uh, I would say, contemporary way, much more linked today to what would be the, the collective requirements uh, of a global economy, and how can India today actually benefit by tapping into an expansion of the global workplace is actually to India's benefit. It is not something which is to India's uh, detriment. So that is something uh, we need to look at. Uh, and uh, you know, on the passports, um, <clears throat> we were talking about rankings. You know, there's, I know there's a ranking. Uh, this ranking is a bit awkward for me to question because Singapore, I think, is right on top. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but I, I give you a very interesting ranking. Imagine if we made a ranking of passports saying conflict situations, people in trouble. Which of your governments will come and get you from there? What kind of, what kind of ranking... What kind of ranking do you think you will end up with? So, you know, rankings cannot be uh, based on uh, how many visas do you need. I mean, it's also a way of ranking. But I would say it, it doesn't cover many other aspects of what a passport is about. I mean, clearly a country with a very large population uh, will have a different basis for a ranking than a country you know, where, which is much smaller, uh, where the mobility requirements or the migration requirements are very, very different. Uh, so, uh, I, I, my own sense today is that uh, where, where uh, the Indian passport is concerned, I definitely see, uh, I mean, in a way, I go back to a question which the young lady asked me before. I see a change, in a way, in India's branding, global branding. Uh, well, when I, I, I saw that maybe around the turn of the century, uh, when this whole tech, tech thing started, you know, uh, people started to look at associating Indians with tech. Today, I, I do think people associate, you know, that sense of a kind of a rising India, uh, things happening out there, uh, very strong economy. I think all of this is featuring into a perception uh, of an India of Indians abroad, and finally on the apps issue, uh, I, you know, I as I uh, said in my uh, remarks itself, I, what do apps do? They generate data. Okay, so you have to ask yourself, uh, how comfortable are you with your data being at which place? So depending on your level of comfort, you will agree with me or not. I can tell you I would be very uncomfortable with my info in some places. So I leave that to you. On, on that note, I have to draw a close to this engaging session. So 
Minister, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and um, taking the questions. Thank you once again, Minister and Dr. Iqbal, for such an engaging and interesting session. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated uh, while Minister and these dignitaries take their leave. Minister has a very important engagement to attend to, so we really appreciate your understanding and patience. And let's put our hand together once more to thank Minister for such an interesting session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.